All right, church. I was uh, I was thinking today about how we all have different comfort zones. Like for me, right now, I feel very comfortable. I, I'm holding a microphone, and you guys are at a nice, safe distance. This is comfortable for me, but this is not comfortable for a lot of people. A lot of people, you put them on stage or hand them a microphone, and that becomes extremely uncomfortable. So I was thinking about just you know how we have different comfort zones, and and I realized that my comfort zones are probably different than yours. For instance, like my physical comfort zone is about this right here, and what I mean by that is this right here is about as close as I ever want you to me. This is as close in proximity as I would like for you to get. This is where I'm still comfortable. We're right here. In fact, it'd be even better if you put your arm out and, and we don't touch fingertips. That's like ideal comfort zone for me. You get inside of that and the alarms start going off in my head. It's like stranger danger. And there's a breach in the comfort zone. People are, are coming in a little too close, like close talkers. Come on, people. Let's little social skills. Let's work on that a little bit. And then on top of that, you got the huggers. Now, I'm not a hugger, and I, I can appreciate if you're a hugger, you like to hug, that, that's great for you. Just be aware that not everybody is a hugger. Like, for instance, never once in my life have I ever said the words, I need a hug. I have not uttered them yet. That doesn't mean I never will. I understand that. There may be a time where those words come out of my mouth. I will let you know if it happens. But it has not ever happened yet. So just by nature, I'm not a hugger. Now, I am willing to step out of my comfort zone and give you a hug if you need a hug. Now, if you just want a hug, maybe we'll save that for another day. So let's be aware that if you need one, you got one. If you just want one, find someone else. That sounds like a good deal to me. Now, with that in mind, uh, standing in, you know, in the lobby and, and greeting people and talking to people is a little bit out of my comfort zone due to the reality that some of you don't care and you will just hug anyway. Last week, I was in the lobby and I see this teenage boy walking over to me and he's got a big smile on his face. And so I smiled back and I was like, hey. And so I took charge of the situation. I reached out. I'm like, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna shake hands, hey! And his hands went out like this and I went, oh! And the next thing I know, I'm like, oh, hey, hey, buddy, we're, we're hugging, we're, we're huggers, Heidi ho neighbor. We're hugging now. And, uh, and then we, we hugged for a minute, it felt like an hour, and we stepped away and he turned around and his older sister, who's a college freshman standing behind him, and she's smiling and I'm like, what's going on? And she says, I paid him 10 bucks to hug you. (laughs) That's just mean right there. And so right right there, in the moment, right on the spot, I said, well, I get half. I want half. I was half the hug. I get five bucks. Where's my five bucks? And she said, well, I don't have it on me. And I looked at the kid and I'm like, you're an idiot. (laughs) Like never trust an older sister. You should know that. You're old enough to know by now. She didn't pay you ahead of time or show you the money. It's not happening. And I was like, come on. Okay, look, I want you to come back next week with my five bucks. If not, don't come to church. You're out. You're no more. But that's, uh, I, I, I did give me a good fundraising idea for our next campus. We'll fund it with, you know, hug the pastor, five bucks a hug, and we'll take care of that thing in a hurry. <laughs> But when we're following Jesus, he's going to lead us into a lot of uncomfortable situations. And so church, I want you to be aware that as we're praying for one, that simple, big, bold, audacious prayer of faith that says, God, please give me one person to share your love with. In fact, we don't just talk about it. We actually pray it. God, please give me one person to share your love with. Would you pray that with me online, Manchester, all together? Can we pray that out loud? God, please give me one person to share your love with. Uh, When you pray that prayer, you might as well just be praying, God, take me out of my comfort zone. God, make me uncomfortable as I follow you. Because that's the reality of what he does is he moves in us. He leads us out of where we're comfortable. And so we're in this message series right now in the book of Acts called Activate, where we're exploring the way the Holy Spirit moved his church and continues to move his church today. Our memory verse is found in Acts chapter one, verse eight. We're gonna put that on the screen. And these words are so powerful and And so I would invite you to read them, but read them with a big, powerful voice today. Let's read them out loud together. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. (coughs) Now, 
what we're told there, what Jesus is telling us is that we're going to receive power, but the power we receive is there to move us outside of our comfort zones. This power is so that we will be his witnesses. And he starts off in a very comfortable place for the, for the followers of Jesus at that time, for the disciples. He starts off with Jerusalem. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. That was comfortable. Jerusalem is what they knew, it was what they understand. It, it was their cultural context. It was their home and kind of the epicenter of their country and their worship and everything that they were about. And then Judea, all Judea, that was still pretty comfortable for them. It was the surrounding area and it was with people that uh, they were comfortable with and comfortable uh, sharing this great news about Jesus and being witnesses. And, and that was pretty comfortable. But Samaria, now we're starting to get a little more uncomfortable. Samaria was a, a place a little bit further out where Jews and Samaritans did not associate. You had great cultural divide there. And there was uh, certainly some bias and some hesitation. It was gonna be very uncomfortable to be his witnesses in Samaria. And then beyond that, to the ends of the earth, that means to the Gentile world, you know, to, to people who were outside of the family of God, to, to non-Jewish people who didn't understand what they were talking about and their customs. And, and it was gonna be very uncomfortable to do that. And so as we think about following Jesus and moving as the Holy Spirit moves us, then I would point out to you this, the Holy Spirit calls us out of our comfort zones. Now, when Jesus promised the Holy Spirit, he did say, listen, I'm gonna give you a comforter. And so it can be tempting for us to think, oh, good, a comforter, because life is hard and life is really challenging and we could all use some comfort. But what we don't understand is that what Jesus is actually saying is, is as his spirit moves us into discomfort, his spirit will be our comfort. And so we never really experience God's comfort when we never move into the discomfort he leads us into. And so the Holy Spirit calls us out of our comfort zone. In Acts chapter 10, we come to this story of uh, the apostle Peter, who was a, a Jewish fisherman when Jesus called him to follow him. And the apostle Peter is going to have a vision and he's gonna wind up going to a Roman centurion's house named Cornelius. Now, a Roman centurion uh, would have been uh, one who was in charge of uh, soldiers in the Roman army. Now, the cultural context for the day was this, the Jewish people were living under Roman occupation and Roman oppression and the ones who carried out the government's desires in oppressing the Jewish people were the soldiers and a centurion would have been in charge of a group of soldiers. So like when Jesus was preaching and he said, go the extra mile, what he was talking about there was that a Roman soldier could force any Jewish person uh, to carry his pack for one mile. Legally, he had the right to make any Jewish person carry his pack for a mile. And Jesus said, don't just go one mile, go the extra mile. Because Jewish people hated the Romans. They hated them, they despised them, they wanted nothing to do with them. In fact, what they wanted to do was they wanted to overthrow the Roman government and kick the Romans all out of their country and remove the Romans from the face of the earth. And then there's this Roman centurion, a soldier, but not only a soldier, but a soldier in charge of other soldiers named Cornelius and he's gonna have an encounter with Peter. And so it's a pretty powerful thing and it's gonna to have to break down a lot of comfort zones for it to happen. So we pick up the story in Acts chapter 10, verse one. <coughs> it says at Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him and feared, what is it, Lord? He asked. And the angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa and bring back a man named Simon who was called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open and something like a, a large sheet being laid down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. 
The voice spoke a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. When Peter, while Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. And so Peter is up on this rooftop in Joppa and he's hungry. So they're preparing him a meal and he has this vision. And this vision is very significant to him because God is going to tell him that all foods now are clean. Now for us, because we're Gentiles, we're used to all foods being clean. But this is like a landmark event for Peter and for the church, for Christians as a whole, because it was a game changer. Peter says, you know what? I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. So he was devout. He was a devout Jewish man who upheld the Old Testament law, including all of the dietary restrictions. So this was a huge shift in thinking that was occurring. And so God was working through moving Peter out of his comfort zone. And it was going to be about far more than, you know, just being able to eat shrimp or something like that. Now, God's doing a much larger thing here. And at the same time, God was working in this guy, Cornelius, this Roman centurion, giving him a vision, and he is now sent for Peter. So while Peter is sitting there wondering, what does this vision mean? Right at that time, the people the centurion had sent are arriving at the gate. And they're arriving there looking for Peter. So God is going to make it pretty clear that he's not just talking about food here, that he's really talking about people and God is moving Peter out of his comfort zone. Now, it is interesting that he sees the vision three times. The number three is kind of significant for Peter. Um, Peter uh, was a follower of Jesus, a disciple. And the night that Jesus was arrested, Jesus you know, told them that they would all fall away. And Peter says, no, I won't. I'll never fall away. He's very bold and very brash. And Jesus says, no, I tell you before the rooster crows tonight, you'll disown me three times. And Jesus was arrested. And Peter was outside of the place where they were holding Jesus, warming himself by a fire, when a servant girl questioned him and said, aren't you one of his followers? And Peter said, no, I'm not. And this happens two more times for a total of three, where on the third time, Peter is like actually calling down curses from heaven. He's cursing in his denial of even knowing Jesus. And the rooster crowed and Peter says, went outside and wept bitterly. So when Jesus was then uh, crucified, and he received our sin inside of him, the sin of all humankind inside of him. And he put it to death in his body and it was buried with him. And on the third day, he beat sin and conquered death and rose from the grave. He then appeared to his disciples. One of the things he did was restore Peter. And the way he restored Peter was he asked him three times, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And all three times Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And so he was restored. Now Peter is you know, leading the church. He is preaching in the name of Jesus, sharing this wonderful news about Jesus as the Messiah. And he has this vision and it happens three times. And it's because God's saying, Peter, this is for real. It's time. You know, Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, all the way to the ends of the earth, even to the Gentile world. And so he has to move us out of our comfort zones for that to happen. Now, our comfort zones, they, they are displayed in a number of ways, but I'll give you a few basic ideas. There's our personal and positional comfort zones. So like in this story, uh, Peter was a Jewish fisherman and Cornelius, the guy he's going to be sent to, is a Roman centurion. So there's some pretty big divides there. Um, there's the cultural comfort zones, which, you know, Jews and, and Gentiles did not associate with one another. They weren't going to be buddies. They weren't going to be friends. They didn't hang out at each other's homes. Uh, there are the ethical concerns, comfort zones. So, you know, Peter, when the sheet comes down and, and the, the voice says, you know, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Peter says, surely not. I've never done this. I obey the law. This would never happen. So for him to go to Cornelius' house, for him, it is a radical departure from his understanding of how to honor God and obey him. 
And then there's the, the spiritual comfort zones that we experience as well. Like, um, you know, I'm not supposed to go there. I'm not supposed to hang out with those types of people or, you know, those types of people are, are you know, maybe so far from God, they're outside uh, of the kingdom of heaven and beyond our reach. And maybe we're not even supposed to. That's kind of a mindset that plays in the back of a lot of people's heads. There are a lot of people out there, a lot of my ones and, and your ones um, who are convinced that there is no place in the kingdom of heaven for them. They are convinced because that's been communicated to them. And one way or another, that has been communicated to them, like where, where the doors to the kingdom of heaven have been slammed in their faces. And that somewhat comes because, well, we go, oh, well, you're unclean and we can't be around you. Or instead of you know, being friends with people, we treat people like projects. Which by the way, I would just pr- propose to you that if you're praying for one, your ones are people, not projects. Please hear me on this one. They're people, not projects. I, I've yet to see anybody really respond to an invitation to be a part of God's kingdom when they're treated like a project. Like, you know what, I, you're, I'm just trying to make a sale here. I'm just trying to, to win you over to my side. But when we develop real relationships with real people where we're sharing God's love and the people are valued, which also means there's an exchange there. A relationship has, has an exchange where uh, we are receiving as well as giving and, and there is value in that relationship. Well, now we're on to something. That's how God moves. And that's what he's gonna do here with, with Peter and Cornelius in, in this story. And so our response is pretty interesting to leaving those comfort zones behind. The first response might be cautiously objective, uh, to, to cautious, cautiously object. That's what, that's what Peter does here. He's like, well, surely not. Like, this doesn't even make sense. I, I'm not allowed to eat that stuff, or I certainly couldn't go to Cornelius and his household. And so there might be an opportunity where God is leading out of our comfort zone and we're like, well, no, this comfort zone is here for a reason. You know, it's, it's kind of what my protective source is. And so we might cautiously object. Then we could stubbornly reject and say, no way, never, Lord. It's not going to happen. Absolutely not. Which is kind of cool that Peter's having this vision in a city called Joppa. The reason I think this is interesting is Joppa is mentioned in the Old Testament. It's mentioned in the Old Testament book of Jonah. You guys ever heard of Jonah? Anybody heard of Jonah? Jonah, the thing that most people know about Jonah, if you've heard about Jonah, is Jonah was swallowed by a, a whale. Yeah, you do have heard about him. Because that's pretty like wild, like somebody being swallowed by a whale and then he gets regurgitated. We think that's pretty cool. Not really cool for the whale or Jonah, but kind of a fun story to think about. But what was happening in that story is God was gonna use Jonah to go to the Ninevites, but that would require Jonah to really leave his comfort zone because Jonah hated the Ninevites. And the reason Jonah hated the Ninevites was everybody hated the Ninevites because the Ninevites were horrible people. They're like Canada. Like nobody, I'm sorry, that's not, I, that's not really true. They're more like Vermont. Nobody liked them. <laughs> nobody wanted to, to go there. And God says to Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and tell them to repent. And Jonah says, forget that. I'm not going to Nineveh. Instead, he went to Joppa and got on a boat and went as far away from Nineveh as he could possibly get. And I don't think it's any real coincidence that Peter's having this vision in Joppa, the same place that Jonah got on a boat where he left to go as far away from Nineveh, the place he was being called and is swallowed by that whale, is regurgitated. Uh, Jonah eventually does say, fine, I'll go, I'll go to Nineveh. And it was the worst preaching that's ever been done. He shows up and he's like, hey, repent, you guys stink. And if you don't repent, God's gonna destroy you. Peace out. Really passionate plea. And, uh, and yet, it, it, yet it worked, God moved through it. And the, the king of Nineveh, he repented, he called for a fast for, the, for all of the Ninevites, they all repented and, and God decided not to destroy Nineveh and he, he saved them. And uh, it says that, that Jonah actually went out of the city and he was ticked and he just sat on the ground and he was mad because this did not seem right to him. Guys, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of people there. With, when some people respond to Jesus and, and are saved and become a part of the family of God, there's other people who are like, what? Not them. Instead of celebrating and, and being excited, it seems wrong to them and they can't possibly understand it. But that's the way the Holy Spirit works. He moves us out of our comfort zone. So don't stubbornly reject or even cautiously object. Instead, we can be like Peter and actively obey. And so Peter is sitting there wondering, what does this mean? 
And at the same time, these guys arrive at his gate. And so the second thing I would tell you about the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit brings people to our doors. Actually brings people to our doors. So this is pretty amazing that while Peter's having this vision, these guys are arriving at the exact same time. He's praying, what does this vision mean? And these Gentiles are at his door. Verse 19, it says, while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for, why have you come? The men replied, we've come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. The next day, Peter started out with them and some of the believers from Joppa went along also. And so God is, is working like upstream. He's working ahead of time. He's working in Cornelius. He's sending these guys. They arrive at the exact moment that Peter's trying to figure out, okay, what does this mean? And these guys ask for him. And sometimes when you're praying for one, God puts people on your doorstep. Now, I've been personally praying for one for over 15 years now. And I've had many ones. I've, I've traveled and shared God's love and, and, and had one-off encounters on airplanes and in different places. I, I've had relationships that were longstanding where you know, I'm sharing God's love on a regular basis and having incredible conversations. But I will tell you the, the place I've struggled the most in praying for one is with my neighbors like the people who live in my neighborhood. I, I just kind of come from that mentality that say, you know, good fences make good neighbors. You know, like we should time our trips to the mailboxes so we don't, you know, cross paths or have to look at each other. And I know that's not healthy and that's not good. And, you know, the Holy Spirit is leading me out of my comfort zone and changing me on that. But in Texas, before we moved here, um, I had uh, neighbors across the street and their names were Vera and her husband's name was Bo. And they had uh, immigrated, the same name as me, they got a kick out of that. And they had immigrated uh, from an Asian country and spoke very little English. And they had a little boy. And Bo got, uh, he had to leave the country for business and he was gone for quite a while. And so Vera was, was there alone with her son. And you know, my way of sharing God's love with Vera for the most part was just smiling and waving and you know, trying to be like courteous and nice, but I really didn't wanna have much more interaction than that. And one day I was getting ready to leave my house to run an errand for my wife. And I opened the front door and Vera is standing on my doorstep. And I was like, oh, hi, Vera. And she was clearly very upset. And she says, hi. And I said, what's wrong? And she goes, well, I, I don't know what this means. I said, well, what means? And she goes, well, I got this letter. And I said, well, let me see that. And so she hands it to me. And I recognized it right away because I had received the same letter a couple of weeks before. It was from our HOA, our Homeowners Association. And what the letter was telling her was that she had weeds in her flower bed in the front of her house. And if she didn't get the weeds out of her flower bed, that they were gonna start fining her every day and that the fines would then compound. Very threatening letter. It's from an HOA. And which is really why I moved to New Hampshire. It had nothing to do with God's call. We just don't have HOAs here because we're live free or die. I mean, I say HOA and you guys are like, what? Let's burn the place down. Let's, this is not acceptable, threatening people. They're not gonna tell me to weed my garden. Exactly, I'm with you. And yet that's what this letter was saying to, to Vera. <clears throat> and so I was trying to explain it to her and she was not comprehending or understanding. And I, said, so the, I was like, so the, the, the dirt in front of your house, um, it has weeds in it and they have to be pulled up. She goes, I don't know how to do that. And I said, well, yeah, yeah, you have to, you have to just pull them up. And she says, well, can you help me? All right, so you need to understand this about me. I don't pull weeds. I, it's not that I'm like above it. I'm not, I'll do all kinds of things. I, I don't like to get my hands dirty. I know it, you can judge me if you want, call me a wussy, I don't care. It's not my thing. I don't like dirt underneath the fingernails. I, I don't like playing in the dirt. You know, I grew out of that when I was four. You guys who like to garden, fine, you're immature. And that's just not me. I mean, to the point where when I got the same letter, because there were weeds in my flower bed, I hired somebody to come to my house and pull up the weeds. And she's like, can you help me? And I was like, well, you know, and she's like, please, because I don't know what to do. And I said, sure. And she goes, right now? And it's like, okay, I'll be right over. And so I went upstairs to change clothes and Summer said, that was fast, you're back already. And I said, I didn't leave. She goes, well, why not? And I said, Vera was at the door. She goes, what did she want? She goes, uh, she got that letter from our HOA about the weeds. 
And, and Summer's like, well, did you give her the number of the people we used? And I'm like, no. I'm going to go over there and weed her garden. Summer's like, what? You won't pull weeds out of our garden. I'm like, I know. And that's the way the Holy Spirit works. It leads you uh, into uncomfortable situations that you wouldn't go into otherwise. And and so he brings people to our doorstep, but then it gets even better. Uh, the Holy Spirit takes it a step further, and the Holy Spirit opens doors. So he opens doors like to our heart to do things we wouldn't have done otherwise, to build those relationships and to be a part of what he's doing. So in verse 24, it says, The following day, Peter arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them, and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said, I'm only a man myself. And while talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large group gathering of people. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. I just, can I read that sentence again? It's a cool sentence. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask you why you sent for me? And Cornelius answered three days ago, while I was praying at this hour at three in the afternoon, suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send a Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest at the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately. It was good of you to come. Now we're all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. And God opened a door. God brought people to Peter's doorstep, but then God opened the door for Peter to walk in and not just talk to Cornelius, but to Cornelius' whole household and all the people that he gathered. And it was a large group of people. And these were gonna be the first Gentile people who would hear the gospel of Jesus and respond. And Peter walked through that door. Now, he didn't walk through it haphazardly. He didn't walk through it without, with owning the, the issues that he might be struggling with. In fact, he said, hey, you guys all know that this is weird, right? Like it's against our law for, for Jews and, and Gentiles to associate or for me to be in your house. But all right, here I am. Like the, some, God's doing something here. And then you guys are all here ready to listen. So, so Peter like starts to tell them about Jesus and so when it comes to walking through doors, I'm just gonna give you a few principles on how to walk through doors the Holy Spirit's opening. The first one is this, shut up. I love this one. Because this I, I really need this one because I can, I can be prone to talk a lot and, and I can argue with God and give him all my yeah buts and yeah, but you shouldn't do this and God, that's not really me. And I, that's surely that, that door is not for me. That door is for someone else. God, just shut up. If the Holy Spirit opens the door, don't argue, just shut up. And then second, shape up and change your mind. Go, oh, okay, well, this, this isn't what I expected. This isn't really what I'm comfortable with. And this is definitely gonna be uh, uncomfortable for me. Um, and I'm gonna step into this discomfort. So it's gonna require me to shape up and rethink this a little bit. And then show up, be there. I mean, th this is huge right there. Peter didn't plan ahead. He didn't prepare. You know, he didn't, he didn't get permission. He didn't get all the disciples together and say, hey, I think God's doing a new thing. Uh, let's, you know, let's pray on this for the next month and decide if it really is okay for me to go to Cornelius' house. The Holy Spirit sends three guys, or sends some people, and he comes down, and the next day they're going, he's at Cornelius' house. Again, a 24-hour period. There he is. You show up. Stop putting it off, just show up and then speak up. Share, share your experience and share what you know. And people will listen. That's what they were there for. Cornelius is like, we wanna hear everything. Um, and we wanna listen to everything that God has commanded you to share with us. And so he began to tell them. And so here's what I can tell you about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is comfort. And what's this word? In discomfort, not from discomfort. And this is a big distinction. The Holy Spirit is comfort in discomfort, not from discomfort. If we start thinking that we're going to follow Jesus and there's never going to be anything uncomfortable or anytime we're leaving our comfort zones, 
we're not going anywhere with him. In fact, I would propose to you that the next step of faith for each of us is an uncomfortable step. It's an uncomfortable step. And yet the Holy Spirit will be our comfort in discomfort, not from discomfort. And so we pick up in verse 44, Peter has told them about Jesus. And it says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They've received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So they ordered that they be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then, Peter at, then they asked Peter to stay with him for a few days. The apostles and believers throughout Judea heard, all that the, heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went to the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them? Starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. So Peter's experience is, okay, God is, is showing him something. The Holy Spirit's gonna move him outside his comfort zone. The Holy Spirit brings people to his door. The Holy Spirit opens the door. Peter walks through. <coughs> and then in that place of discomfort, the Holy Spirit moves and actually shows up and comes on Cornelius and his entire household. And so now Peter has obvious evidence to say, all right, I, God is in this. He is moving in this. He says, all right, there's water. Or, you know, why, they've received the Holy Spirit. That he should be, they should be baptized. He orders that they be baptized. But then he's got some explaining to do. He goes to Jerusalem and, and the circumcised believers, the Jewish believers were all like, what are you doing? How dare you go to a, a Roman centurion's house, to a Gentile's house? And she, this was for us. I mean, they're like ticked. They're like legitimately ticked. They're like, what, what are you doing? Because it didn't make sense to them. And I just, I love that Peter doesn't get angry. He doesn't get mad. He doesn't just leave. He starts and he tells them the whole story. And it's pretty amazing how, how quickly this was received and people listened and things changed in a hurry. As I will tell you that as we're praying for one and as God is moving and he's using his church to, to reach our ones, even right here in New Hampshire, that there's gonna be critics of that. That's okay. You don't have to get your wheels shot off by that or be angry. Certainly don't be defensive. Don't waste an ounce of energy being defensive. But you can tell the story. Like when people don't understand the methodology, I can't believe you guys use that kind of music and it's just a rock show and yeah, all the stuff people say. Are they like the objections people have? Like, I mean, going to arenas and, and, and doing the arena thing and Christmas Eve services that aren't even on Christmas Eve. Okay. That's not, that's not like in your, your worldview and what you understand. But we have the opportunity to tell a story. Yeah, but this is what we're seeing. This is what we're experiencing. This is how we see the Holy Spirit moving. And guys, I think, I think the church, the family of God is really eager deep down to get out of our comfort zones, respond to the Holy Spirit. And it is encouraging. It is encouraging. In other words, it adds courage when people see other people taking steps of faith into discomfort. It is encouraging. And so church, we have the opportunity to respond on a regular basis to the Holy Spirit as he leads us into discomfort where he then is our comfort. Whatever your next step of faith is today, it will be an uncomfortable one. And that is okay. It's actually really good because the Holy Spirit will be your comfort in that discomfort. And so as we take a moment in our, in our time together to share in communion and to say yes to Jesus, I also want to challenge you to say yes to his next step of faith for you, an uncomfortable step of faith. And so no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what's been done to you, you're invited to say yes to Jesus, to say yes to his work that he's done for you and his salvation and the eternal life and the invitation to be a part of his family. Take the bread, take the juice, hold on to that until we've all been served. But also say yes to taking your next step of faith, an uncomfortable step of faith. For instance, something like baptism. 
For some, that is very uncomfortable. I've met many people through the years who were deathly afraid of, of water and the thought of having their heads submerged under water was terrifying for them. And for them to respond in baptism, that is a massive step of faith out of their comfort zone. Massive. Even more common are, are people whose family dynamic is such that if they were to, to be baptized and, and to say yes to that step of faith that their, their family might disown them, their family w- certainly wouldn't understand. They would be upset with them. They would say things like, oh, it was what we did for you, not, not good enough, or how dare you betray us like that. And it's uncomfortable. But the Holy Spirit will be your comfort in that discomfort. And if your next step of faith is baptism, there's water. We'll, we'll do that today. Maybe your next step of faith is some kind of lifestyle change. And you know what? It's, it's terrifying to think about. You, you know, it's kind of been nagging at you for a while now. You, you, you know that, that it's off and you know that it's not what, what God desires and he has something better for you, but it's terrifying to think about making that change or leaving that behind. But today's the day you take an uncomfortable step of faith and, and you say yes to where the Holy Spirit is leading. Or maybe something's got a, like a strong hold on you. It's been holding you back and you can't shake it. You can't break it on your own. You, you, you've tried and you've kept it hidden and you kind of fostered and maintained it there in the background. And God's been telling you, he's been saying, hey, you need help with this. You need help with it. But man, that's uncomfortable. And today's the day you're gonna step up and say, I need some help. And you're gonna take a really uncomfortable step of faith and you're gonna ask somebody to pray for you. And you're gonna put a name to it and you're gonna say, this this is it, this is it, I need help. You can do that online, you you can do that at either of our, or any of our campuses, you can, at the end of the service, you can come forward, we have people who are ready to pray with you. For some of you, yeah, Maybe it's, it's giving. Like even the fact that I would bring it up right now, you're like, I knew it was coming. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. Because that's your thing, man. It's, it's captivated you and it's controlled you. And like, you know already that God wants to deliver you and set you free. Let's go. Take a step of faith, trust him. An uncomfortable one, let it go. Whatever your next step of faith is, the Holy Spirit will be your comfort in that discomfort. And so as we share this time of worshipful communion with him, I I wanna pray a blessing over all of us online in Manchester and here in Bedford. And let's hear from him and let's take our next step of faith. Father, we thank you that you have promised us comfort But your Holy Spirit is comfort in the discomfort, not from it. And so, Father, please show us, every one of us, what our next step of faith is, what our next uncomfortable step of faith is. Let us say yes to you right now. And we ask for that in the name of Jesus. Amen.